videographer actually, and I've been working in Indonesia as uh, peatlands in Indonesian Borneo for quite a few years now. And I'm actually going to uh, start today by talking about this um, conference I attended last summer that sort of stuck with me. This, this material and the that stuck with me. And I've, I've been thinking about it ever since, and I thought this might be a really good opportunity to sort of explore the ways to understand what, what I observed there um, in light of some of the discussions that have been going on, um, in light of this idea of soil care, which I find really intriguing. Um, but I have some questions about it. Um, so basically, last summer I went to the uh, International Peat Congress. So this is an every four-year event. It's been held uh, for the last 60 years. The director of the International Peat Con Congress, I believe, is a Finnish, Finnish man currently. Um, and for the first time ever, uh, last summer, it was held outside North America or Europe. I've always been in Europe, of course. Um, and it was in Sarawak, Malaysia. Um, and it was a really interesting site because there were about 500 people there. There were peat experts from all over the world, from North America, from Europe, um, a lot of uh, Asian scientists as well, representatives from all the major NGOs, um, and a lot of industry folk, from, especially from Asia, who were involved in the oil pulp and pulp wood industries. Um, and the keynote speaker was actually not a scientist. He was um, a Malaysian man. Of, well, he was a forester, but also the chairman of Tahan Holdings, which is a Chinese Malaysian company uh, with a lot of subsidiaries all over Indonesia and Malaysia. And oil industries. Um, he gave the keynote speech to this audience of about 500 people, and he said, I, I quote, um, there are allegations from some people that there could be peat soil decomposition going on, but the level of the soil is not different from before, and he's referring specifically to the peat soil found mostly in Malaysia. Because of this, I am convinced that the level of decomposition is negligible. We need a reality check. The third generation trees are still straight, they're not leaning, and the NGOs have demonized oil palm. And then, it gets better, he actually went on to, just to compare NGOs, uh, of which he was referring to the major transnational NGOs like World Resources Institute, Nature Conservancy, Wetlands International, these sorts of organizations. He compared them to the 17th century Dutch colonists who massacred many uh, people in what was then um, the Dutch East Indies. So this was sort of became a sort of fantastical uh, presentation, and it elicited a lot of eye rolling uh, for people in the audience, especially the American scientists who were sort of like get on with it and show us the science. Um, so this was a quite an interesting uh, uh, venue, I think, to sort of explore some of these issues around um, the legacies of the first post-colonialism, right? Because we're facing Malaysia. Malaysia, of course, was a British colony. Um, Indonesia was a Dutch colony. Um, and for the next three days of this conference, what what happened was. Uh, all of this, this so-called kind of Western science, or the, the experts from North America and Europe, were in rooms smaller than this in the basement of the hotel presenting their findings. A lot of them were you know, peat soil scientists. And the Malaysian industry people and Malaysian scientists were upstairs talking to rooms of 400 people in these very large ballrooms. And it actually felt like two completely separate conferences were going on with the so-called science experts, which would be, I would say, those of us here today, vanished to the basement, right, while the kind of spotlight was on Malaysian industry. Um, the only direct rebuttal to any of these claims that were made by the Malaysians, um, and not as much by the Indonesians, but the in Malaysia, um, was from the Dutch uh, director of Wetlands International, again, a Dutch man. And he said, you know, the only thing I've heard this morning is denial from the Malaysian scientists and Malaysian speakers. He said they are in complete denial about how their companies are going to be underwater literally in the next couple of decades as the peak decomposes and <coughs> Um, but what's really striking, I think, was the complete lack of dialogue, right, between a lot of, and I'm saying Western scientists, there were some Indonesian scientists there as well, who were you know, kind of on their side, um, who, who preferred to remain apolitical about a lot of these issues, right? They didn't actually want to confront the reality of, of the fact that peat soil in Indonesia and Malaysia is completely under a sort of capitalist production regime. Um, meanwhile, the Malaysians uh, were, were very, I think, aware of the politics um, involved here. So a couple takeaways from, you know, that I was left with and now thinking um, being here this week is this idea of soil care, right? So I am really intrigued by this idea of soil care, but I'd like to sort of put it in play um, and in conversation with, um, with a sort of larger understanding of capitalism, right, across a very large landscape. So we're talking about 20 million hectares of, of peat, uh, peat soil in Indonesia, over half of which in Malaysia, half of which is devoted to commodity production for oil palm. Um, so the Malaysians basically were claiming a sense of soil care, right? They were, they were arguing, I'll talk a little bit more about that, that they have found ways to better manage the peat soil than they do in Indonesia and than they even do in Europe. Is this soil care, right? If, they, if they're claiming this, I'm sort of interested in exploring this. Um, and second, I think 
think in light of what uh, Selim Dori talked about yesterday, I, I'm curious again about this post-colonial science studies framing, right? So I was at first sort of thinking about, wanting to think through this relationship of what happened to the conference in terms of the legacies of colonialism and what that kind of means, you know, for the pushback we're seeing from Malaysians and sometimes from the Indonesians. Um, in terms of sort of this not wanting to, you know, be this vessel for Western scientific expertise that was showing up in Sarawak, Borneo, and they were resisting that, I think, quite strongly, right, and quite overtly, and actually saying, no, we have a better way. Um, but I'm not, I'm not so sure that that framing actually fits here, in part because of, of the capitalist circuits, right? So this is not, if you sort of add the political economy element into this post-colonial science, the whole kind of framing falls apart um, in some, somewhat because of the structure of these oil palm and coal wood industries. Um, so a little, just a very brief background. Um, Pete Swamps, I think, actually, two, two speakers this morning did a good job of touching on some of the things I would talk about, about microbes and microbial oxidation of these waterlogged soils. So um, under kind of normal, semi-normal conditions, uh, peat swamps look like this. They're typically underwater, very tannic, black water. Um, and to get a sense of where they are, so we have uh, Sumatra, Indonesia on the left, and then Indonesian Borneo, and then Sarawak province is at the top, that's Malaysia. Um, so this is all of the peatlands uh, that have been mapped most recently, and you can see, with the exception of some green splotches, Basically, all of them are what, in a sense, is considered degraded, or they're in concessions um, for various types of industry. Um, and even if they're not actually planted with oil palm or coal wood trees, the act of draining peatlands affects a massively large hydrological area, right? So it'll affect things like dozens of kilometers away, and hundreds of kilometers away. So the entire sort of peat ecosystem tends to collapse uh, quite quickly. Um, so to give you a sense, this is the yellow and purple is all of the concession licenses. Um, across Indonesia and Sarawak. Not all of this is peat, of course, but you can see just the magnitude of land that's been given over to licenses in the last you know, 20 years or so. So you really can't talk about peat soil in Indonesia and Malaysia, right, without contending with this industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry with completely global tentacles, right? You've got British and American banks who are heavy investors in a lot of these companies. Um, a lot of the immediate capital is Singaporean, it's Malaysian, it's Chinese, it's Indian, right? A lot of the the product actually goes to China and India now for cooking oil. Um, palm oil, of course, is in pretty much everything. Your shampoo, your toothpaste, right? Your cookies, your cakes, everything. So this is a completely, right, it's a global industry. Um, and the fact that, you know, a lot of scientists, I think as we've been you know, talking about, I think Salvador mentioned yesterday, uh, don't want to kind of engage with the politics or the economics of the soil, right, is really a big loss um, in terms of actually confronting what's happened to this sort of landscape, and I'm talking national landscape scale of system here. Um, so a really brief schema of what happens um, as peat becomes sort of starts to decompose. Granted, this is a schema that was drawn by some Dutch consultants, so a lot of the Malaysians would take issues with this. Um, but basically, a lot of the, the peatlands that I've worked in most um, closely in Indonesia are not coastal; they're actually inland. And peat farms there, they're abrogenous peatlands. You can see on the left, they actually the peat will form under tens of thousands of years between two rivers. So they're actually it's entirely rain-fed. Um, it's partially decomposed, you know, trees, trunks, and leaves, and all this stuff. It doesn't actually fully decompose, as they were talking about earlier. Um, and you get this buildup of peat, it actually, in some places, goes up to 20 meters um, in parts of Indonesia. Um, but when you, when you, if you want to make, turn this into so-called arable land, it's never really that arable, but um, to try to drain in some of the water and convert it to some sort of agriculture, you have to build large canals through it. So they tend to cut canals, especially the ones that go through the center of the peat dome, starts to collapse the entire peat dome. And then once the water table drops, you can see in the third one, you get both microbial oxidation that starts to eat away at the soil, so the soil is sort of literally disappearing. Um, minute by minute, it's turning, you know, releasing carbon dioxide and actually, you know, transferring that carbon balance into the atmosphere and then also subsiding down to the water table. Um, and the other thing that happens is fire, right? So a lot of the, the soil actually becomes extremely flammable when it's dry, and the soil itself starts to burn. So that's actually been more of my focus I'm working on a project in Kalimantan um, with some fire scientists trying to better understand the kind of mechanisms and land use practices that contribute to peat fire um, as it goes into the ground. Um, so just a couple, you know, the, the instances of peat fire, it's really kind of a bizarre phenomenon. You can see the fire here, it's actually spread underground through tree roots. Um, stuff tends to smolder, so it's not flaming fires, but some of the flaming stuff on the surface, uh, flaming leaves or something, um, under the right conditions can catch the soil itself on fire and then start to eat away, kind of at a web. So you can see, you know, here you have these landscape scale fires that happened 
Um, 2015 was the worst year in the last 20 years in Indonesia. Um, you might have seen in the media, I got picked up on here because they were really extremely bad. Um, yeah, they're accepting something, there were some, some studies recently that said um, 100,000 people, they expect early mortality as a result of the air pollution that was generated by the tree fires in Indonesia. Um, Singapore tends to get a lot of attention for bad air quality around that time, but it's actually about 100 times worse. In Kalimantan, you know, closer to where the land was actually burning. So this stuff is extremely noxious, and of course the, the transfer of carbon from the soil to the atmosphere is enormous. There are some sort of gross statistics that said on certain days in September and October 2015, the daily emissions from Indonesia's peat fires actually ex exceeded the daily emissions from the United States fossil fuel use. Right, so we're talking an enormous amount of carbon that is transferred to the atmosphere extremely rapidly. Um, these kind of smoldering fires that are basically impossible to put out. You can't put them out. They only get kind of put out through rain, um, except in rainfall. So to turn a little bit um, back to the Malaysian presentations that were going on here. So again, this was, this was actually taken from the director of the um, Sarawak Peat, uh, Tropical Peat Laboratory. She was one of the organizers of the conference and is, is kind of... Um, demonized by a lot of uh, European scientists for having kind of incorrect data, and they've accused her of lying to the United Nations about greenhouse gas emissions factors from Malaysian peat soil, so she's not a very popular figure um, in a lot of places, but she's become quite vocal, and it has a lot of industry support, so a lot of her work is actually paid for by the oil industry. Um, and the kind of crux of the arguments that she was making, she gave about three or four different presentations over the course of this peat congress, um, is that compaction prevents fire and peat land. And she was arguing with this sort of diagram, and again, I'm not a soil scientist, but um, people can correct me if I'm wrong, that if you keep, and she loves this phrase, tight and moist, and she keeps repeating it, if you keep the peat soil tight and moist, you're not going to have fire, and you're going to have um, oil palm that will continue to grow, and it won't fall over, right? And you'll be able to kind of maintain productivity of these lands over time. So they basically said, we have engineered this land so well uh, that we're both preventing fire and we're allowing productivity, right? Um, so this was another, another demonstration from her laboratory they had on display, and she had the, oil, uh, the soil core taken from oil palm plantations. And basically what I think they were trying to illustrate here is that uh, in their oil palm plantations, they have maintained soil moisture that is almost identical to some of these other, or even higher than some of these other more natural peat swamps, um, while also kind of making the soil more pure, right? So they've been able to take out you know, this undecomposed uh, logs and things to make the soil actually better, right? So they have this sort of soil improvement narrative um, going on. And then finally, so another kind of important point that they were making, uh, this was one year after the 2015 catastrophic fires in Indonesia, um, again, you know, if we had not keep, kept our peatland compact and moist with good water management, we would have suffered the same fate as Kalimantan, that's Indonesia, Indonesia Borneo, um, with peat fires sweeping through our land. Um, again, she was not taken seriously uh, by most of the European scientists, but if you look at the data, um, so I pulled up the fire alerts, so this was high probability fire alerts um, from September 1st to October 31st, 2015, so the height of the massive fires. You can actually see Sarawak province up there at the top of Borneo really had very few fires. It's quite remarkable, whereas you can see there were tens of thousands of fires that kind of blanketed Kalimantan at times and Sumatra as well. It was a real, a real disaster. So is there something to this, right? Um, should we be taking her, not we, but should the, should the Western sort of community be taking her seriously? Um, I'm not sure how to kind of understand, uh, I guess, you know, this idea of soil care, because in some sense, um, a lot of what they were talking about is that, you know, under the conditions of capitalist, under the conditions of capitalist production, we have devised ways to better care for these soils, right? And if you take at face value that there are, you know, 20 million hectares, that's over 40 million acres of peat soils or land in general, Asia that is kind of entrenched in this capitalist circuit, right? It's not, we're not getting out of that, right, in the immediate future, right? How do you deal with that, right? A lot of the sort of typical soil science doesn't um, make a lot of sense in that case. So I'll just make um, a couple more brief, very brief points and then a few conclusions. So um, to counter some of the data that she was throwing out, this is a Dutch consultant's uh, model basically showing how much uh, oil palm has expanded in part of Sarawak and then modeling in a hundred years time roughly um, how all of the blue is land that will be underwater, right? So basically saying, you know, they're in complete denial of their situation. Even with this good hydrological management, the soil is continuing, uh, continuing to emit carbon and in 100 years will be completely flooded, right? This land will have to be abandoned. Um, so these are pretty much at odds. I'll skip sort of the fire. I'm happy to talk about this later. Um, so just 
just a couple of uh, conclusions here. So again, I, I'm thinking through, you know, what relevance does this idea of soil care have on a scale, right? I think a lot of what we've heard about soil care is in relation to like a garden or a small scale farm or um, something that seems kind of manageable on a human scale, right? But we're talking about, um, you know, 20 million he uh, hectares of, of peat soil, right, that needs to be sort of managed and policymakers and scientists and Southeast Asia are tending to figure out um, how to do that. So I'll end there and just Thank you. Um, I, I think what 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 you've said sort of provokes in me a, a thought about something that was raised earlier about our relationship with soil. There are other things that mediate our relationship with soil in the natural environment. So plants being the being the one, I mean plants and animals that all sort of mediate that relationship. So in terms of what you're talking about, I think we need to think about how we define the boundaries of how we think about soils. Um, are, they, are we thinking about soils in, in isolation or soils as a part of a system? And then that allows you to think about what are the boundaries of that system, and is it is it is it a field? I mean, you, you can you can take lots and lots of different scale boundaries, and scientists in this room and beyond work at lots and lots of different scales. But I think the real challenge is how we how we integrate those scales, and how we utilise knowledge gained at one scale to understand other scales. Yeah, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I was actually going to going to you know have time continue to talk about the fact that um, uh, a lot of the so this is the conference and kind of in their publications, a lot of the scientists. So a lot of most of them are you know British scientists or or Dutch, uh, some Americans as well have claimed have kind of made this repeating claim that I personally would tend to agree with that this is a, a, an issue of global concern, right? They sort of press it on a global sort of scale and say you know this is not about us telling you what to do. This matters for the planet as a whole. And it's been interesting, and I, you know, at first I sort of I understood that completely, but then you know to see the Malaysian reaction, they're they're coming from a perspective again in which um, I think they feel like you know the West and Europe is telling them how to one run their economy, right, and telling them you know exactly how to use their land, right. So they have a very different take on what it means to be global. It's like well, you know, they can always come back to the fact that you know, well, you in Europe you destroyed your peatlands as well, so why can't we do the same thing? You know, so it's actually. Um, yeah, so from a scientific perspective, I think, you know, seeing these sort of global planetary boundaries becomes quite easy and wants, it becomes the frame that I think we want to use to understand this, but then doesn't quite capture a lot of the responses, you know, in Asia. How good are, are your scientists at resisting the production of ignorance? Obviously, in my experience, they are terrible when they are attacked by people who are in the business of producing ignorance, in the case of climate, of course. How come it... Do they, are you the only one? Or, I mean, <laughs> do I come in from sociology in order to help them defend themselves, or are they already good at organizing a defense? Um, I would say they're terrible, and I think I suspected that before, and then this conference last summer kind of put that on display, which, um, you know, there was a day-long series of keynotes, and it was really strange to have these Malaysians, some scientists, some industry people, um, make these really wild claims, right? Comparing NGOs to, to Dutch massacres, I mean, it's crazy. And then to get up and see this sort of proper scientific, apolitical, you know, I'm gonna present my data tables and ignore everything that just happened. So um, that was really clear, actually, that happened. They were extremely poor, I think, at resisting, resisting that. I wanted I wanted them to kind of get into it. <laughs> but are they organizing? Are you organizing them? Um, well, actually, I should say one thing that did come out of that was that 106 people signed a letter to the editor for the, uh, that was published in the journal Global um, Change Biology. And I, again, I think it was maybe the wrong venue because part of the Malaysian um, uh, argument is that you know, you're having these conversations in these journals that we're not a part of, right? They're not actually speaking to them. So they kind of offered this, this journal article, it's online, and um, it said you know, the Malaysians were sort of dangerously thinking about all of these issues. Um, but again, it's like, where, where is the conversation that's happening, right? Well, the academic journal letters. So you are the now me or of peace. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Arthur. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to finish another conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 